I have the immense pleasure of introducing Bradley Gothrop. Right? Uh, Bradley is a general purpose electronics geek and tinkerer who spent the last decade uh, designing, building, and installing electric pipe organs um, and control systems which make them work. And if your wiring doesn't work, nothing else matters. No amount of firmware development, board layout kung fu, or component selection can make up for fa failures in wiring. Strangely, this totally essential work is rarely taught or even discussed. Bradley will help us understand these important lessons. Please welcome Bradley Gothrop to the Hackaday Super Conference stage. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. So here's an experiment you can do. Give your first conference talk to a bunch of people who know way more than you do about the area of expertise, whom you respect, and make sure to give it on the second day so that you can spend the first day answering the question, what are you talking about? And discover that the areas of interest are not necessarily the ones that you wrote about as much. So I hope you'll forgive me if I present out of notes and uh, I don't look up, I promise I still like you. So we're doing, uh, we're doing wiring boot camp. I'm talking about wiring. Spoiler alert, wiring is the process of connecting things together with wires, not the programming environment. If you were ho hoping for a talk about the programming environment, I, you can throw vegetables, I'm sorry. So I'm very glad you're all here because trying to pitch a talk on wiring is like among the top five most boring things you can imagine, right? Like, ooh, a half an hour on wiring, sign me up. Everyone's really excited about that because, you know, to most folks, you tell them you're going to talk about wiring. A half hour talk about wiring is like a cooking show where they spend an entire episode talking about the washing up. Like, we're, we're going to do half an hour on washing up today. Or today on the new Yankee workshop, sanding. <laughs> it's going to be good fun. In reality, though, learning to deal with wiring and make cables and making cables is more like code commenting. Though, I guess that probably doesn't help the pitch for it being exciting. Uh, well, so, as you heard, I'm Bradley Gothrop. I spent the last 10 years building pipe organs, and here's another experiment you can do at home. If you want to see someone's brain crash, the next time you check into a hotel and they ask you why you're in town or what you do for a living, you can say you build pipe organs. So... If you try that, the reaction you get will be identical to if you had said, I shoe and groom unicorns. They do not know what to say. They will stare at you for a moment and then they'll go, organs? And you'll go, no, not, not those kinds of organs. And they'll go, organs? And you'll go, no, not those kinds either. I build pipe organs. Those are the kinds of organs that I build. Now you may want to know, yeah, no, very good, thank you. That one's not one of mine, I should hasten to add. That one predates me by a long time. So usually once you mention Phantom of the Opera, you can bet, get people around to thinking of this kind of organ. Now you may wonder to yourself, so you know, pipe organs have been around since the wheelbarrow was emergent technology. What does this have to do with wiring? And the answer is uh, my homeboy Robert Hope Jones here. Robert Hope Jones was sort of the classic Victorian mad scientist inventor type, right? And after basically inventing the British telephone switch stack, he decided that he would build pipe organs for a living. Now a guy like that looks at a machine like that and predictably says, you know what this needs? This needs hundreds of electromagnets. That's what this needs. <laughs> so at this time, you're talking about 1895, as it happens, a lot of the things that put upper boundary limits on how big and how ludicrous these already big and ludicrous machines could be were mechanical. So as soon as you bring electricity to the equation, like the doors have been blown off. Like, do you want, do you want tens of thousands of pipes? Sure, we can build organs with tens of thousands of pipes. Do you want to play them from outside on a long cable that runs back into the building? Sure, you can play it from outside, why not? But you're not gonna get by with this anymore because the organs are huge now. You need more keyboards, obviously, and you're gonna need switches and buttons and gadgets of all kinds. And by the time you're at the end of that sort of design process, eventually you get here. 
Now that is the input device for a machine that is seven stories high. It has 28,750 pipes. It weighs about 287 tons. Uh, this one's in Philadelphia. This is, a, this is in a department store. That's a long story, don't ask. Just the blowers supplying that puppy with air total 168 horsepower. So that'll give you some idea of the kind of scale that you're talking about. So if you are wondering how a musician sitting in the center of this is going to get anything done out here while also playing, the answer is that these little round buttons underneath the keyboards store and recall sets of positions of the controls on either side. And remember that this is from before the age of the transistor, so that happened with uh, far away from this machine. It's all been wired to a K or so of pneumatic read-write memory. Have fun building that. This was also in the days before serializing, so as you can no doubt imagine, this involved a lot of wiring and switching arrangements that were all pneumatic as well, and the sorts of things that would have blown Johann Sebastian Bach's brains right out of his ears, because this was the sort of nonsense that you ended up with acres of in the switching stacks of pipe organs, rooms upon rooms of this kind of thing. So, in short, for a time, pipe organs were neck and neck with telephone exchanges as the most complex electrical installations being built in the United States. Now, transistors changed some of that, and serializing changed a lot of that, though not as much as it probably should have. But the organ builders today still run a lot of wire, and it's always unique. So automation and sourcing out your harnesses is not a thing that we can really do. So, despite having worked a job that goes back several hundred years, my last job involved running enough wire for a private space program. Now, that's actually how it is in a lot of trade jobs. The thing is, outside of the trades, most makers and even credentialed electrical engineers have pretty much this reaction to the wiring problem, right? They're, they're always sort of secretly scheming in the back of their mind to make it someone else's problem. Like, we'll, we'll put that on to the guys in production, and that'll be great. But, uh, you know, it's something we tend not to think about at all, or we tend to think about it only after all the prototyping and stuff has been done. This is sort of the default mode for that discussion. People quick and dirty the stuff together, and then they think of worrying about wires and connectors and that sort of thing as a form of premature optimization, which is not quite right. If that's your view, I do want to change your mind, but it's important to understand the reason that I want to change your mind and the reasons that I don't. I'm not trying to have you make tidy cables because I am tidy. I am not a tidy person. I, <laughs> this, is, this is better than normal. If, if you really doubt me, you can talk to my partner. She'll clear you right up. Uh, I'm not here to sell you on tidiness for its own sake. I'm not here to feed you a line about elaborate uh, wiring giving you a deep zen and the art of cable lacing craft satisfaction. I'm not here to tell you that uh, when I came up in the business, we laced our cables together with cat gut and straw and felt lucky and that kids today just don't have the skills, that's, that's not where I'm at. I'm here to make the case that paying more attention to your wiring early on in prototyping and for one-off pieces and installations will save you a lot of time. It's an ounce of prevention. And not only that, the time that it will save you is the worst kind of time. It's time fruitlessly troubleshooting intermittent problems. We have all been there, and I think we'd like to be there less. So if you're still not sold, consider the following. Does this sound familiar? Somewhere in your history, maybe your very recent history, has been the dire prototype. You know the one. This is the prototype where the wiring looks like a tumbleweed. It went together in a hurry, but it works most of the time. It works, but then it sometimes stops working if you touch it. It works, but it doesn't work after you've moved it from your bench to demo it. It works, but it doesn't work once you install it in a site. We've all had those, and if you say you haven't, you're lying. So, most of us learned this way, right? But think back, how often have you spent hours of your life, or hopefully not days, but it does happen, troubleshooting something you thought was a problem with your circuit or with your software that turned out to be a problem with your wiring? 
crappy soldering, wires shorting each other out, all that kind of stuff. All of that can go away. It's an experience that we can do without, and it's not hard to get rid of most of those problems, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Now, it's all what I wish I'd known when I got started. That said, disobey me. These methods are what work best for me in my applications. They're not meant to be exhaustive. You can't be exhaustive on this topic. And you can and should experiment with your own ways and play around with uh, techniques and connectors and things the way most of us play around with you know, new ICs and stuff that come across our bench. You should be bringing that tide of parts across your bench all the time. And you should not accept dogma from anyone at a podium. So enough uh, preliminaries. We should talk a little bit about planning. So I don't know about you, but the way I prototype has changed. With all the breakout boards and I squared C and SPI devices and such, what used to be like a breadboard full of passives and wires akimbo and all that kind of stuff has become instead like a dev board in the middle and like a constellation of breakout boards all around. Right? That's, that's a very different way of prototyping than we've all sort of been used to. It's also a sort of prototyping that's well suited to making cables because you're not carrying all that many signals around between those boards. And it's a whole lot easier and it's a whole lot more reliable to take those signals around in cables than with jumper wires on breadboards. So if this is the way that you do your prototyping, you are in luck. If you are laying out uh, your PCB, then there are some other concerns, but we'll, uh, we'll come to that in a minute. So if that's how you prototype, then start with a sketch to plan out your cables. If you're all thumbs with a pencil, fritzing is actually a really good tool for this, even if you don't take it any farther than this in fritzing. It will get you through that part of the process. You need to know how many conductors you've got, where they're going, and you know where they stop along the way. This is particularly helpful with like I squared C, where some of your pins are going to stop in more than one place. And no matter how your breakout boards are, arranged VCC and ground are always going to stop in more than one place. So you want to have a plan for how that whole thing is going to come together. If you are laying out a PC, uh, PCB, you can save yourself some, uh, some trouble by making sure that if somebody plugs the connector in the wrong way around, that you do not let out the magic smoke. You can also make sure that if someone plugs it in one pin in one direction or the other, it does not let out the magic smoke. And the very best reason to make sure that that's the case is because invariably you will be the one who does it. And you will have an audience when it happens. It's a guarantee. This is also helpful because a lot of connectors are surface mount now, and a lot of the surface mount connectors can be soldered in either orientation, even if they are polarized. So you can put the connector on the board, the polarized connector, backwards. This is a thing that happens in prototyping way too often. So if your connectors are unshrouded, it makes sense to worry about transposition, but it always makes sense to worry about polarization. It's a good practice to put your connectors near mounting points for your boards, whether that's screws or standoffs or whatever. You often have to push on these things pretty hard. You don't want to be in the habit of bending PCBs. That's bad news. And the bigger the board is, the more prone it is to those kinds of problems. So whether or not you lay out your own board, if you use square pin headers, I think it's a good idea to use right angle headers and to keep it all out on the edges. Now, the reason for that is that it keeps the wires out at the perimeter of the board and not in the way of your test points or your LEDs or anything else you want to be fiddling with on those boards. The other nice thing is that if you use right angle headers, you can still get probes on all those signals when everything is connected. So you don't have to slightly pull a connector out and try and sneak. I know I've done this. How many of you have done this? OK, that's what I thought. So use right angle headers, and then you can stick the little grabby probes that they make on those things, even when everything is working properly or should be working properly. At least everything is connected properly. Once you have a sketch, uh, I think I've lost my place. Oh, there we go. Once you have a sketch, uh, it's also helpful to have a list of point-to-point -point connections. This is elementary stuff, but it does bear repeating. Don't skip it, because you will forget stuff. And once you've made the cable, adding one line to the cable is not as easy as it would have been at the start. 
So once you know what your cable's gonna look like, then you need to start worrying about wire. Now, when I was new, the array of wire options was a little bewildering. We're gonna talk a little bit about the details individually, and then I'll give you some shortcuts. Obviously, the first thing everyone thinks about is gauge. For lab use, most of the time, if you do the math on current, which I assume everyone in here knows how to use Google well enough to do, <laughs> you'll get away with keeping three sizes of wire. For me, those sizes are 24, 18, and 12, but it's gonna depend on your work. But for most of what you do, something to carry signal, something to carry a moderate amount of current, and something to carry supply amounts of current will do you, and there are good reasons to keep it down to, uh, to just three, because not having a random assortment of sizes and circulation has all kinds of advantages. For one thing, you can keep crimps in the sizes that you know you'll need, so you don't find yourself having the wire and not having the crimps or vice versa. It lets you keep strippers, the ones with the little set screws on them, set up for those sizes. If you don't have $100 to drop on really nice automatic wire strippers, um, the little ones with the set screws on them set in those sizes will save you some time and money, and you'll get a good sense for how big your bundles will be, which is helpful if you have mechanical considerations to worry about. If you have to drill holes for these cables to pass through, if you have to bring them around corners, you'll use those sizes of wires often enough to get a really good uh, sense going for uh, what they're gonna be like. Strand count is the next thing that most people think about. Um, the more strands a wire has, the more flexible it can be, obviously, which is to say it has less memory and structure of its own. But the first thing to say about strand count is a very useful number of strands is one. A lot of people don't use solid gauge wire. I wish more people would. It's easy to strip, it's easy to probe, it's easy to crimp and to solder, and it's stiff, and that's not necessarily a drawback because a flexible cable is great to have in some settings, but a cable with some structure to it is easier to handle. It's easier to put connectors on. It's easier to pull than a really floppy cable. I mean, a stiff cable can help hold up its own weight. So if you're wiring vertically, like on a panel or in any of those kinds of configurations, if your cable is stiff, it's carrying enough of its own weight that you're not hanging all that weight on the connectors. It's holding itself up. That will lengthen your service life. You'll have less problems pulling connectors off of boards. It's particularly a problem now because so many of the connectors, again, are surface mount. In the old through-hole pin days, you could count on those mechanical connections much more than you can when they're just down on pads. So be nice to your connectors and use uh, fairly, uh, fairly stout wire. All three of these cables are 24 gauge. But that one's solid, and that one's stranded, and that one's silicone with a gazillion strands in it. And you can tie it into knots and untie it and not realize that anything happened. That's really cool if you're doing textiles or something like that, but it has problems in other places. So if you're going to talk about uh, insulating materials, what you'll learn is that uh, certain insulations tend to be paired with other wire characteristics. You can get almost anything you want in PVC, but if you get silicone, what you're going to get is really high strand counts. And if you get Teflon, what you're going to get is silver wire on the inside, 99 times out of 100. So it's not necessary to necessarily take a parametric approach to it and say, I want this insulation, this kind of wire. Um, you're going to find that they fall into categories based on usage. Nobody wants to be in the business of making wire and sitting it on a shelf. So you're gonna find that it tends to sort of glom into categories, and those categories are easily identifiable by the material they're using to insulate. If you need something other than PVC, you'll usually know it. Uh, the, only, uh, the only disadvantages that PVC has in most uses are it's not very heat resistant, which can be a problem if you're hand soldering or if you're in like automotive applications or something wacky. But for the most part, PVC will, uh, will do you. Silicone is a special case. Um, you need to be cautious if you use it because the insulation is thicker, it breaks everyone's spreadsheets, and uh, it does not fit in the crimps necessarily for its gauge indicated size. So you have to be careful to make sure you have accommodation for it. So, uh, you know, too long, didn't read. If you need something other than PVC, you probably know it. Um, silicone's trendy right now, but be careful about it if you have to use crimps, and you should be using crimps. We're coming to that. So color, 
uh, you will make your life easier if you keep colors. If you keep enough colors to be able to use red and black always for VCC and ground, the number of times you let the smoke out of circuits will go down. And if you keep enough colors around that you can tell what stuff is with your eyeballs instead of a meter, you'll pull a lot of uh, hours out of your troubleshooting and double checking of stuff. So if you can't afford to keep a lot of wire on the shelf, uh, a trick I picked up actually from Micah Scott, who in here follows Scanline? Okay, the rest of you should. Um, is you can shrink, you can heat shrink in colors on the ends of white wire. That works all right, I like it a lot. It's, it's a bit of trouble, but if you just have to have markings on one end, it's a heck of a lot better than color charpies. And it's, uh, it's significantly uh, better in that respect. Now, tinning. Do it. <laughs> it's easy to buy cheap wire that isn't tinned. It's never an economy. It's never an economy. If you ever have to solder that wire, you're going to fight with it if you have to uh, put it through even crimping processes because crimping is gas tight, but whatever happened to your wire before you put it in the crimp has already happened to your wire. So if you have a stranded wire that's oxidized, you're just out of luck. When you buy wire from China, you don't know what you're going to get in the box. It can be very disappointing. <laughs> you can get bargains, but make sure that you check what has come back in the box. Because you can just have your whole day or whole project ruined and, and you, don't, you, don't, you don't want to be that guy. Wire can actually be really hard to buy as odd as that sounds, unless you're buying gigantic quantities or very small ones, it's hard to get consistency. Um, I'm including some of my favorite suppliers in the additional materials for this talk, which will, uh, which will go up in the next couple of days online, and I'll give you some part numbers for that and crimps and other things, but you're going to have to experiment, you're going to have to audition your wire suppliers, and it's one of those situations where it can be best if it matters to find some local people who are dealing because they're dealing with the manufacturers directly and they're going to give you the same thing every time. You're going to pay a premium for that, but it's, uh, it's oftentimes worth it. The, uh, if you can afford it, big, school, uh, big spools are almost always a better value in terms of length and the peace of mind of having everything you need is really nice to have. Now, preparing wires. There are a lot of ways to prepare your wires, and everybody I know has different preferences, but in general terms, if you're going to prepare a lot of cables with crimp connectors, and I think you should, um, you're going to want to be able to strip wires without nicking them, and you're going to want to be able to do it reliably and to very consistent lengths. Now, maybe you're a ninja with these. I don't know. I, I never got to that point, but uh, I think it's probably worth investing in the good stuff. And... I will not advocate that you buy $300 crimping tools from Molex, but I will advocate buying $100 automatic wire strippers from WIA. And if you're going to do uh, serious amounts, and I mean like thousands and thousands of contacts, that's when you start looking at weird stuff, not these, but these. This is a mains powered electric wire stripper. It is a weird piece of equipment. You won't encounter them very often, but they are out there. They're not terribly expensive. They're a little awkward to use. But this fella here is a, is a nichrome bridge with a V-shaped notch in it. So you could sit the wire down in it and give it a half a turn and just pull it out. You cannot nick the wire because there is nothing sharp in it. You cannot use it with silicone wire because silicone wire is heat resistant and it shrugs it off. Um, they're good to have. Know that they're out there. It's not something you'd use a huge amount. Um, if you can't afford to go big on your uh, stripping apparatus, that sounds a little wrong. Um, you can get the cheap ones that have the set screws on them and set them up for the sizes of the wire that you're using. Um, audition before you've got you know, a cable with 40 leads in it, and now they all have to get shorter because you've you know, gone too far with the first one. Uh, let's see. So connectors, um, bad news first. There are a dozen large scale manufacturers specializing in connectors. They each have hundreds of series of uh, connectors in their catalogs, their websites universally suck. And <laughs> parametric search for connectors from major suppliers is not much better, right? 
So the products themselves are very good and they're getting better and they're reasonably affordable and the easy majority of the ones you'd want to use are compatible with inexpensive universal crimping tools. So I'll put it like this. If you're starting out making cables, you can go a long way with square pin box headers in 2.54 millimeter and 3.96. The parts are everywhere. You can always buy them. They're never out of stock. The tools are cheap. It's very forgiving. You're in, good, uh, you're in good shape. And that's a really good set of training wheels. And beyond that, you should look at the offerings from whatever manufacturer you like that are suited to your particular work. Have a running stash of that kind of stuff coming across your bench so you can play with it before you're putting it in something that matters. Um, don't uh, don't uh, put an unfamiliar connector in an important design. It will bite you every time. Now, if you're designing for manufacture overseas, JST as a brand is affordable and ubiquitous over there. And that's why you're seeing so much of it lately coming back in consumer products. It's good stuff, but they make a lot of different series that look similar at a glance. So compatibility can be a real pain in the ass. So make sure you don't get bit by that. Whenever someone mentions a JST connector without specifying a pitch or a series, take a drink. Stop before you pass out. Now, if you've never made crimp housing style cables before, it's so easy, you really have no good excuse not to do it. Uh, these are 2.54 uh, millimeter uh, spacing crimps. The big ones work exactly the same way. These are crimps, they come on reels or loose. Um, some people don't mind cutting them off of the little reels. I really do mind cutting them off of the little reels. The price difference is not all that much. Uh, I don't like the sharp edges that it leaves when you cut them off of the reels. That's really designed for an industrial process. Uh, I'm gonna suggest buying them loose. The, uh, if you aren't familiar with them, they have two sets of wings. The back set of wings grabs the insulation. The front set of wings grabs the conductor. And then as soon as you hold it up, you realize how long you should have stripped it. And the, <laughs> and the uh, first one will, uh, will tell you what the second one should be like. So the, uh, these are universal crimping pliers. There's a million varieties of them. I auditioned a whole bunch so that I could recommend a good set to you in this talk. These are the ones that Adafruit sells. Buy those. Other tools carry that same serial number, that same name, but like all mass-produced products in China, you don't know what you're getting get in the box. Don't be that guy. Uh, buy the ones that Adafruit controls because they control the jaws and the quality of the jaws is everything on those. These ones are uh, EDM machined and they're uh, awesome and affordable. So you just uh, stick them in the little ratcheting pliers like this. It sticks out the other side like uh, so. The only thing to bear in mind when you do this process is this little tab that sticks up right here is what holds it in the housing later, so don't mash it flat. And um, you just uh, pop the puppy in there and uh, squeeze the trigger and you're off to the races. There are tons of uh, standards documents on how these crimps ought to be crimped and the exact you know, specifications for all this stuff. That's interesting reading, sort of, if you're bored. Um, but keep in mind what it's really there for is standards control in large manufacturing environments. It's like soldering standards, ISTM and that sort of thing, right? It's not, uh, it's very forgiving. It's much more forgiving than you think. Uh, stick those uh, connectors right in there into the housings like that. And, uh, and you're off to the races. It's really, it's too, it's too trivial to make a talk out of. That's why we're doing so much other stuff. So. Once you have a cable with more than a few wires in it, or one that has several branches in it, you're gonna have to deal with bundling. And there are lots of ways to do this, and the most popular these days is zip ties. Braided tubing also works well, and it looks nice if you start early, like before your connectors are on. <laughs> this is the heat shrink conundrum again, right? How many of us have done that one? Now, I very rarely use zip ties because I'm uh, seemingly always out of the right size and cutting off the tails is annoying. And I don't like the way that it bulks out the cable with lumps that catch on everything and make the cable harder to manage. So this is where we come to the gospel portion of the program. Because I am going to uh, ask you if you have a few moments, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to hear the gospel of cable lacing. 
99 cases out of 100, I am going to use cable lacing. It is, there's a great deal of misinformation that goes around about cable lacing, and unfortunately, we don't have time in the talk to actually teach how to do it thoroughly. I had a, a good chat with some uh, people at Hackaday uh, earlier today. There's going to be a video on cable lacing that I'm going to do for them very soon, so be watching out for that. But the pitch is this. Cable lacing is dirt cheap. It's really fast. It lies flat. Um, and it's quick and easy to rework if you know how. And unless I'm making many identical cables, I rarely do anything else. Um, for the uninitiated, cable lacing involves trussing the cable up with flat waxed twine and knotting it at intervals. So for many years, it was the standard in telephone work. It is still the standard in aerospace work for all kinds of good reasons. If you take a little time to learn it, you will not look back. However you bundle your cables, however, you want to restrain them up close to the connector when you can, so that the wires being pulled, if it gets pulled to the side, don't put all the strain on the last pin, the farthest one away. If you bundle it up close to the connector like this, then you won't get that kind of problem so much. So now we're down to the, um, the automants, sorting out part numbers for compatible crimps, housings, and the, all that kind of stuff is, um, once again, a real pain in the ass. Don't try and work it out from your favorite uh, provider's related products as they come up. I know it's tempting. It seems like, oh, that looks right. It's never right. It's never right. Don't do that. It's not reliable. It's confusing as hell. Uh, one good place to figure out part numbers is actually from the websites of the manufacturers. But weirdly, one of the best ways is to consult the page-formatted catalogs of your favorite distributors, like Mauser and DigiKey, because all of, the pro all of the stuff for that series of connectors is all together in that place. I know that most of us gave up anything page-formatted a long time ago, like, give it to me in the browser. What is this PDF nonsense? But in this case, that's what you want, because they've gone to the work for you of putting it all in one place, and it's almost always better than um, the better job of it than the manufacturers do. So we're going to see uh, this particular example is uh, is Mauser, by the way. And Mauser used to be, I'll give this quick tip. It used to be easy to get to the page of a catalog for a product from Mauser. It used to be a link right there in the page, and they moved it. It is still present, but it is now in the documents tab where the data sheets are. Yeah, I don't know why they did that. Uh, tools, if you have been scared off by seeing connectors or uh, tools uh, listed with a crimping tool that costs $11,000, you don't need to worry about that most of the times. Don't let it freak you out. You can almost always find a generic crimping tool to do the job. Some manufacturers helpfully publish data sheets for their crimping tools that have dimensional drawings. That's very helpful for those situations. It makes it easy to know what you're looking for. Oftentimes, drawings of the crimps themselves will also give you the same information. There are weird ones out there for which weird tools are required, but they're easy to avoid. The real reason that they make tooling like this is because uh, they want to sell turnkey cable production to mass manufacturers, and they don't want to support anyone else, the results of anyone else's tooling. And money is not a big issue in those situations, so uh, they're expensive and wacky. Screw terminals. How many people in here hate screw terminals? OK. I understand. I bet many of you have uh, put stranded wire in screw terminals and mangled it so badly that when you had to move it to another port, you couldn't make it work anymore, and you had to cut it short and strip it again. That happens often. How many of you have not been able to get it gripped tightly enough in the screw terminal to be secure without trying to screw up the uh, actual soldering of the screw terminal? All of these problems occur because it is not that screw terminals inherently suck, but because we are missing an important piece called the bootlace ferrule. Now, if you've never seen these before, you're almost certainly an American, like me. <laughs> it turns out that like the imperial system, mass incarceration and tea made with lukewarm water, the absence of bootlace ferrules is a particularly American ignorance. <laughs> They're basically ubiquitous in the rest of the world, and what they are is basically tinned copper tubes with a plastic insulator on the back. You fit them over your wire and use a special crimping tool to smash it all into a solid slug that screw terminals can actually grip. It looks like that. Isn't that adorable? It, 
It is very, it grips like an SOB. You will not believe it the first time that you use them. It's great. Now, it is also an off-label use, but you can use them to splice small lines together in certain circumstances. This is especially useful for daisy chaining, but your mileage may vary. I use this trick a lot for VCC and ground in cables that go from place to place to place. I also use them when I'm going to solder wire to board. I do not solder wire to board very often, but when I do, it's nice to do it this way because it's much easier to solder, and then if you have to change something, it's also much easier to desolder than the stranded wire would be, and it provides some measure of strain relief. These are the crimping tools you use to do that. Buy the cheapest, crappiest thing that you find on Banggood because even the good ones aren't very good. You can pay $100 for good ones and it will do you no good at all. It's uh, dead simple to do, put it on there, follow their schedules, you need smaller ones than you think, crimp them on there, and Bob's your uncle. And that is all that I have for you today. This website will have all of the accumulated nonsense from this talk and part numbers and recommendations. It will go up in the next few days. You can find me on Twitter now, you may throw vegetables. You may find me in the rest of the conference and ask me questions. Thank you all very much.